Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my Friday message. This week, Duke received international media coverage for reporting the early outcomes of an historic achievement in patient care. Last summer, a baby at Duke was the recipient, believed to be the first recipient, of a combined heart and thymic tissue transplant from a single donor. In the early analysis, the child appears to be developing immune cells that will recognize the donated heart as self and therefore reduce or eliminate the need for prolonged use of anti-rejection drugs. The process thymus tissue Im implantation method was pioneered by Duke's Louise Marker. This first in human combination of procedures was performed at the university hospital last summer under an expanded access application cleared by the FDA and represents not only a milestone in heart transplantation, but an even broader implications for organ transplantation. Congratulations to Joseph Turek, Chief of Duke's Pediatric Cardiac Surgery, and the entire surgical team who performed the landmark procedure, and to Dr. Market for her groundbreaking work developing the methodology behind successful thymus transplants. Now to COVID. COVID cases and hospitalizations continue to, to decrease nationally, locally, and at Duke. This week, the state of North Carolina reported just over 520 cases and just over 1,000 hospitalizations. Locally, Durham's seven-day average positivity rate is now 2.3%. Using the new CDC classifications determining county status based on rates and hospitalizations, Durham is down from red to yellow, meaning that while broad mask mandates are no longer in place, individuals at higher risk for COVID-related disease should make individual decisions regarding masking outside the home, particularly in circumstances that increase the probability of exposure, like crowded indoor settings. In Duke University Health System, we currently have 58 COVID admissions. And to put that in perspective, last summer was the last time the number of patients with COVID hospitalization in the Duke system was under 100. And currently, about 53 total employee cases across both the university and health system, which is a significant decrease from prior weeks since the beginning of the new year. And this is all much welcomed good news. The continued reduction in cases and hospitalizations have led to an easing of masking mandates across the campus, county, and state. Locally, in light of the fact that Durham is now below that target of 5% positivity, the city and county have ended its indoor masking mandates this past Monday. Orange and Wake, Co and Wake counties have also ended their indoor mandates. Duke University announced last Friday that it has revised its indoor masking requirements. As of past Monday, fully vaccinated individuals at Duke will no longer be required to wear masks inside most campus and lease facilities. However, masks will continue to be required for all individuals in in-person classes, on Duke buses and vans, and in clinical and patient care areas, i.e. within Duke Health. Masks are still required for Duke Health employees, patients, and visitors in our hospitals and clinics. This is being done as we continue to care for vulnerable and sick patients. However, it is important to note that the virus is still circulating, albeit at low levels, and therefore, anyone who is experiencing COVID symptoms should, should wear a mask, not report to work or attend classes, and get tested as soon as possible. COVID-19 at some level will continue to be circulating for some time. The new norm will require all of us to move from decisions based on mandated guidelines to individual decisions made based on our own personal risk. Full vaccination, including booster, is still by far the best personal strategy. Those with increased personal risk or living with those at increased risk of COVID-related disease should continue to wear a mask when the probability of exposure is significant. And I would strongly recommend that, that each of us have discussions with healthcare providers to assist in making those decisions. It also means that we all must respect individual decision-making, particularly around masking and personal distancing. We will continue to follow the data with the recognition that policies may change if the pandemic takes a different turn. But we now are armed with so many more options. On top of vaccination, two COVID antivirals developed and approved are becoming more widely available and have shown significant efficacy in preventing severe illness and hospitalization when taken soon after symptom onset. The National COVID Preparedness Plan now includes a test to treat strategy. Through this program, people who test positive for COVID-19 will then be able to get at the same visit 
and antiviral upon approval by a qualified healthcare provider. This will be possible at hundreds of local pharmacy-based clinics, federally qualified community health centers, and in long-term care facilities. Individuals who receive COVID-19 test results through at-home tests or another testing site can also utilize a test to treat location to receive a prescription from a qualified healthcare provider and treatment on the spot if eligible. A federal test to treat website now locates participating pharmacies, which is in development and anticipated to be launched in mid-March. This will markedly facilitate those at risk for significant disease getting timely antiviral treatment. Let me end with more great news. Congratulations to Dr. Susanna Nagy and Sudarshan Raja Kapoor. Both have been elected to the American Society of Clinical Investigation. The ASCI is one of the nation's oldest and most respected medical honor societies. What a wonderful and well-deserved honor for both. And finally, a heartfelt thanks to Jason Stout. His regular COVID updates have sustained many of us over these past two years. He's been a voice of scientific truth, wisdom, and with a healthy dose, dose of humor. For that, I and so many others are personally grateful. Thanks to everyone for all that you do and have a great weekend.